Ahoy! And welcome to Prague, and welcome to another edition of the Mars Guide, still under government restrictions. So last time we asked the question, what have the Czechs ever done for us? Apart from giving us this beautiful city of Prague, golden frothy beer, Jaromea Jagra, and contact lenses. Well, the next one on our list is known as the father of genetics, Gregor Mendel. And I'm sure that some of you at some time will have come across the name of this monk. So how did this unassuming 19th century monk become an instrument used to torture biology students as well as be given the title of the father of genetics? How did he come up with the laws of Mendelian inheritance before anyone had heard of him, including Charles Darwin, author of The Origin of the Species? Why did he use pea plants in experiments? Why wasn't his work recognized for nearly 35 years? Why did he apparently ask for all his notes and results to be burned on his death? And why in the 1930s did he attract the attention and concern of the famous statistician R.A. Fisher that gave rise to the Mendelian paradox, a controversy that still rages today? Answers coming up in the video. Johann Mendel was born to German-speaking parents in 1822 in a place called Hinchitza, which today is in the Czech Republic, but at that time was part of the Austrian Empire. When he grew up, his parents' family, who had been farmers for centuries, naturally wanted Johann to become a career farmer and work on the family farm. However, the local priest told the Bendels that their son was exceptionally bright. At that time, paying for an education was expensive, but one way to cover the cost of your education was to join a religious order. And so eventually, Mendel became a monk at the Monastery of St. Thomas in Brno, which is the Czech Republic's second city, and took the name of Gregor. In time, he became a teacher, but because of new government regulations, Gregor needed to pass the teacher's certificate exam. He flunked it, probably because of exam nerves. In fact, Mendel was quite a fragile man, maybe a snowflake, before they were even snowflakes, and often took to his monastic bed if things didn't go well. Bless. But in all fairness, it is very highly probable that he suffered from heavy bouts of depression. Nonetheless, the monastery believed in him and thought that he needed even more education. So he was sent to the University of Vienna where he got to study botany, physics, mathematics and astronomy. Also, while he was at the University in Vienna, he was introduced to a host of scientists and modern thinkers that helped to shape his theory on genetics, including Franz Unger, the botanist, and the mathematician Christian Doppler, who came up with the Doppler Affair. Having studied at university, Mendel felt more confident when it came to the teacher's examination. However, one of the examiners was the botanist Edward Fenzel, who was a passionate believer in the spermus theory. Spermus believed that an animal or plant was perfectly formed in the sperm of the male, and when it passed to the female, she provided nothing apart from a place to help it grow, like a greenhouse or an incubator, if you will. Mendel disagreed because he believed that the characteristics of the offspring came from both parents, and both parents contributed to how the offspring looked. As is the case with arrogant scientists who believe they are always right, Fenzel failed Mendel. So even though he was without a teacher's certificate, he was allowed to stay at the monastery in Brno, and turned his attention to the question, how are the characteristics of parents passed on through the generations? He started to experiment with animals of several species, such as sheep and mice, and several species of plants, in particular the pisum species, which is the common garden pea, which you probably know about. But then the big boss, Bishop Schafkoch, heard that monks at St. Thomas were doing breeding experiments with animals. The bishop thought it inappropriate for a priest to observe sex, so he went to the monastery and put a stop to all the monks' experiments for once and for all. Mendel was clever enough to make an agreement with the bishop to stop the animal breeding experiments, but to continue with his plant experiments. The bishop agreed, probably because he didn't realize that plants had sex too. And for those interested, if plants are your thing, you can find more on Corn Hub. Mendel chose the common pea plant. The pea plant can be easily grown and maintained. They are naturally self-pollinating and can be also cross-pollinated. It's an annual plant, therefore many generations can be studied within a short period of time. It has several contrasting, very distinctive characteristics, which were not blends. Plants were either white or purple. Their seeds, smooth or wrinkled, etc. 
His groundbreaking work took seven years, between 1856 and 1863, and he used about 30,000 plants, and his paper entitled Experiments with Plant Hybridization was presented to two meetings of the Natural History Society of Brno in February and March 1865. Although it got favourable local reviews, it didn't spread much further, and its significance lay unrecognised for nearly 35 years. Mendel sent reprints of his paper to some of the then most prominent scientists working in the same field, including the author of The Origin of the Species, Charles Darwin. But it's said that Darwin never even read his paper, and in fact, probably didn't even open the letter. It was only in the 1900s where his contributions through the work of several different scientists working independently who had replicated his findings that his important contribution was acknowledged. In that time, his paper only received three citations. That is, other researchers had only referred to his work on three occasions over 30 years. Why had his work remained unrecognised for all that time? Possibly because he was a monk that nobody had heard of and he was not a particularly good communicator. At that time, botanists normally described a new species of plant. They didn't provide you with pages and pages of tables and data, so no one really understood what it was all about, possibly because experiments with pea plants are not, as a bishop thought, particularly sexy. And more than likely, but unfortunately, when he published his paper, the new topic that was trending was Darwin's theory of evolution. Darwin's book, The Origin of the Species, was published in 1859. So you could imagine, if it was today, it would be something like hashtag Darwin, hashtag Darwin theory of evolution, hashtag humans descended from apes, hashtag we're all monkeys. It's going to get more interest than the hashtag monk experiments with peas, hashtag give peas a chance. Now, I'm not going to go into the details of what he did since there are a plethora, a huge number of great videos on YouTube that go into greater depth and explain the Mendel's laws of inheritance. But for you to understand the Mendelian paradox and how it came about, I'm just going to go simply through some of his findings. So for example, Mendel cross-pollinated purple flowers with white flowers and noted that the first generation flowers were all purple. He then self-pollinated the F1 generations and in the next generation F2, he found again the purple plant dominated, but this time white flowers appeared. And there was a ratio of three purple flowers to every white flower, a ratio of three to one. He coined the terms dominant to describe the characteristic or trait of the purple color and recessive for the white, since the purple color seemed to dominate over the white. In addition, Mendel used the term factors to describe the characteristics passed on from one generation to the next. Today, these factors are called genes. In 1936, the statistician R. A. Fisher, who it said was a fan of Mendel, looked critically at Mendel's results and reanalyzed them using more modern statistical methods. And the results for Fisher were somewhat alarming, because he felt that statistically, Mendel's data was too good to be true and fitted beautifully with Mendel's theory. In essence, he was now accusing the revered father of genetics of being a forger. But as an admirer of Mendel, Fisher gave him a get-out clause. He wrote, Although no explanation can be expected to be satisfactory, it remains a possibility, among others, that Mendel was deceived by some assistant who knew too well what was expected. Nice of Fisher to indicate that the results might have been forged, but it might not have been Mendel's fault. In the years following Fisher's damning assessment of Mendel's findings, others have rallied to support Mendel, and thus we have the Mendelian paradox. Some strongly believe that he is the father of genetics, and that, being a monk, he was an honourable man who would never have done such a thing. Some, as I have described, suggest otherwise. Recently, it has been suggested that Mendel introduced unconscious bias into his results. That is, he was not aware of the fact that he was manipulating the data to fit his theory. And it is said the reason why Mendel asked for all his notes to be burned after his death was that he was worried his data and results would be thoroughly scrutinized and that he might be exposed as a fraud. Now, I don't think that's true, and it's probable that the monks at the Abbey didn't recognize the significance of Mendel's findings. But the burning of his notes may have been related to his public opposition to an 1874 taxation law that increased the tax on the monasteries to cover church expenses. 
for me, Mendel was without doubt a visionary. He predicted quite rightly that one day his work would be recognized. He was a fastidious yet humble experimenter and in spite of the nitpicking detractors, deserves wholeheartedly to have the title the father of genetics and is another example of what the Czechs have done for us. So there we are. I hope you found this video interesting and informative. If you would like to be notified about future videos, please don't forget to click and subscribe and press the little bell button for notification. Thank you for watching and I look forward to seeing you next time.